The Frankenstein monster of the 1931 film was a grotesque mannequin in sync with the machine age aesthetic of Art Deco. Modern art was sweeping the world of advertising, architecture, and industrial design. It combined Cubism, Expressionism, and Bauhaus in its zigzagging style. The Frankenstein monster reflected this, its parts ripped from human corpses and reassembled in the words of the monster show, according to new logical angular electromechanical principles, which suggested the human brain and consciousness bolted into a machine tooled skull. The head became more like a box with a lid. At the same time, the heavy brow reflects a devolved ape man. As both Neanderthal and a product of the techno occult, that which we now recognize as Frankenstein is the monster, not the doctor. It is the dehumanized, transhuman, posthuman, created to be a robot slave, but drawn to strike out at its God usurping creator. This is the image held of us by the fallen in rebellion against God, unclean spirits and their elite human collaborators. From King Kong to Planet of the Apes, to inoculations cultivated on monkey viruses, to rumors of AIDS spawned by human monkey intimate contact, to viral monkeys in the movie Outbreak, to monkeypox and so much more. Through the revelation of the method mandated by ritual magic, the enemy is telling us what lowlifes we are and like monkeys in the jungle, they will entice us and lure us to our doom with shiny trinkets of genetic engineering, robotics, artificial intelligence, and nanotechnology. Promising long life and superhuman abilities, the same promise as in the garden to eat of the fruit and be the equal to God but the bait and switch actually shackling us to the hive mind panopticon, the temples of our bodies emptied of the Holy Spirit, taken over by the unclean in a mass possession event, the real zombie apocalypse that was enabled by what we permitted into our bloodstream in our fear, lack of faith, and reluctance to see the enemy for what he is and that he waits for us to blow ourselves and our God-given world to bits like the Frankenstein monster. The elite of the global techno occult, the GTO, serve the fallen and unclean as the laboratory hunchback, the Igor, taunted and contorted by avaricious sin and a rapacious appetite to acquire and dominate, usurping dominion from God. Our successful desensitization by this GTO renders us blind, incapable almost, of perceiving the genuine mind-shattering terror of Frankenstein and Dracula in 1931. Skull sees the opening credits of Frankenstein as immersing the viewer in a primal kind of experience, simultaneously infantilized and terrified by monstrous eyes whirling like stroboscopic discs, jolted by the opening scene and sound of earth crashing on the lid of a coffin. Director James Whale placed the microphone in the casket to magnify the reverberation. Since then, there have been dozens and dozens of such scenes. But at the same time, it was frightening, at that time, it was frightening and chilling. David Lewis noted that at a preview in Santa Monica, some audience members got up, walked out, came back, and walked out again. Now we are so inundated so much more, so much earlier, that we have lost our sense of what is horrible and profane, and therefore we have lost our sense of what is truly beautiful and sacred. 
Frankenstein presents an abomination stitched together from the cemetery, executed criminals and med school specimens, animated by machine age technology. Electricity was equated with the spark of life, a fitting theology framed by the foul spirits that were manifested as lightning bolt wielding Zeus, whose temple at Pergamon is likely the throne of Satan referred to by Messiah in the book of Revelation, and as Baal, the storm god, nemesis of God's chosen people, and god of thunder Thor, who in his inaugural MCU outing was cast out of the heavens like Lucifer, falling to earth like lightning. Electricity. Now in the name of disingenuous claims about human impact on weather, we are gradually being weaned from the relative freedom and autonomy provided by fossil fuels. We are being herded to the perpetual holding pen of the electric grid to be poked with cattle prod inoculations and cut off from the grid if we deviate from the narrative of our own slavery. Controlling us is just a flip of a switch. And exactly where will that electricity come from? Fossil fuels, I suppose. To the 1931 audience of Frankenstein, still reeling from the trauma of the first barbarism-enhanced modern war, it was easy to believe that we were just dead meat jolted to motion by an electric spark. Skull tells us that untold millions had been left with the feeling that modern life and death was nothing but an anonymous, soul-crushing assembly line. The enemy commenced this process in earnest at the onset of the Industrial Revolution and urbanization. Work, which had been in household craftsmanship and apprenticeship, shifted to factories and offices where one was stripped of status and connection to the fruit of one's own labor, replaced by wage slavery in an environment owned by someone else who managed your time and activities moment by moment. We were intentionally alienated from nature and the integrity of our labors. Eventually, in practice, even God took a back seat to science and technology. This was much more true in 1930 than in 1830, and in a few years we will reach 2030 with its agenda for a so-called sustainable future. Then we will dive headlong into the dark waters charted for us by our enemy. But in that darkness, we can remain steadfast, focused on the light of Messiah. In 1832, the magic working put forth by Enter the Mine Entertainment to apprentice workers displaced to factories was the Jump Jim Crow dance craze, America's first such phenomenon, by blackface performer Thomas Dixon Rice. This culminated in the big bang of American popular culture, blackface minstrelsy, which was the world's dominant diversion for half a century and still a mainstay of high school productions until the end of the 1960s. In its run, minstrelsy, engendering raw emotions of racial supremacy and resentment, deeply embedded the enemy's black and white chessboard into all corners of American life and diverted all concerned from the manipulations they were surreptitiously subjected to. A hundred years earlier, later, excuse me, the time was ripe for the dark fruits of Freud and technocracy to be unleashed, corralling the populace into a self-absorption that sought titillations and thrills from beyond a workplace they found simultaneously stressful and drudgerous to the point of numbness. Dracula and Frankenstein were inspired by the fallen to meet that need. In the Great Depression and the reminder of powerlessness it ingrained, the villagers could now grab their torches and pitchforks and lose themselves in the mob, justified in their rage to kill the monster. At the same time, they could identify with erotic predator Dracula or the neck-bolted bio-machine who violently lashed out in answer to his abuse. <coughs> Excuse me. 
In December 1927, David Skull writes in The Monster Show, the interdependency of Dracula and Frankenstein images were formalized and successfully exploited. This was done by the modest traveling repertory of actor Hamilton Dean. Dean had persuaded the writer Peggy Webling, who grew up along with her sisters as part of a popular juvenile performance troupe, to adapt Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as a companion to his group's Dracula. Like Mary Shelley, as well as the actress who would play her in the prelude to The Bride of Frankenstein, Elsa Lanchester, who would play the monster's reluctant mate as well, Peggy Webling was an irreverent iconoclast and accepted the assignment readily. Although vampire tales had excited and frightened even the not-so-faint of heart since ancient times, Bram Stoker's 1897 novel Dracula breathed new life into the undead and the 1931 film of that name catapulted the Transylvanian Count into a pop culture phenomenon. The Monster Show says Dracula was one of those jazz age thrill machines the audiences couldn't resist, sort of a theatrical equivalent to the Coney Island Cyclone, another 1927 invention that was attracting record crowds. In that year, Time Magazine noted how much had changed in 25 years. Now young women could watch grisly horror on stage and smoke cigarettes during intermission, talking calmly of their minor vices. Between 1830 and 1930, the industrialization and urbanization of American life ripped people away from religion, from moral supervision, and family, land, community, and heritage. This culminated with those born near the turn of the century who were the real breakaway from tradition generation, not the counterculture of the 1960s as is commonly supposed. No longer craftsmen and apprentices, men were reduced to wage slaves in factories, while women were told it was a newfound freedom to be wage slaves in factories. Thrills were needed to feel alive and in touch with some emotional, visceral reality. Alienated and numbed by an artificial mass society with every minute of work time controlled by a boss, individuals sought sensation in the shimmering neon night. Lugosi was America's death symbol, especially to American women. As he put it, it was the embrace of death their subconscious was yearning for. Death, a final triumphant lover. So in an age of escalating isolation and estrangement, this was a misbegotten intimacy and a false sense of belonging to something greater than yourself. Love and lust were now inextricably and pathologically intertwined with violence, death, and darkness of the soul. Skull calls producer and publisher Horace Liverwright, who brought Dracula to the stage and phenomenal success, the self-appointed ringmaster of the American id. He published and popularized an introduction to psychoanalysis in America and also orchestrated the relationship between the queen and king of Eros and Thanatos, Clara Bow and Bela Lugosi. Horace Liverwright's uncanny intuition regarding the modernist zeitgeist saw, a, saw the kinship between the flapper and the vampire, narcissistic materialist who embodied archetypes bubbling up from the unconscious. He instinctively knew what was or what was about to be popular among the New York theater-going crowd. He automatically comprehended that the theme of Promethean overreaching was relevant at the end of the Roaring Twenties. Liverwright was the very first to popularize the flapper image in the book Flaming Youth, which he published in 1923. According to Bram Stoker's legend, vampires must be invited in before they can enter a house. They then come and go as they please, and the same is true of demons. Universal Studio owner Carl Lemley was not enthused about inviting Dracula into America cinema, reportedly. 
He could not understand the appeal and contended that even the most terrifying Lon Chaney movies, which built his studio, were human stories. Dracula was a blood-sucking demon from hell. He thought the public had gone crazy. However, his son, Carl Lemley Jr., thought it would be a big hit. In 1931, the Depression was hitting bottom. The American dream seemed to have failed. Bitterness and fear were everywhere. The Jazz Age lied in ruins. Everyone was looking for someone or some group to blame or to be a savior. This was the mechanical, scientific age of man, and fewer focused on the actual savior. Skull points out that it was a time that people poured anger and cynicism into the gangster picture. As pop culture is more culture creation than money-making enterprise, this was part of a rollout to demoralize and to get people rooting for the bad guy, sympathy for the devil, creating moral chaos and confusion. Prohibition had already turned millions into criminals, just as other culture creation had turned them into drinkers in the first place. Skull further says that the most lasting and influential invention of 1931 would be the modern horror film, which opened up possibilities of psychic lawlessness. A monster for Hollywood was a gangster of the id and unconscious. The metaphysical genesis of individual and societal lawlessness, which would spiritually corrupt. Just as our present day fear of infection panics us toward a pharmacia, which is brew of transhumanist genetics and the techno occult, the 1931 monsters were populist surrealism, a counterpart to Salvador Dali, rearranging the human body and a real world gone frightening, blurring the boundaries between people and other species. These monsters objectified anxieties induced by the bombardment from new incomprehensible technology and science. These had assaulted familiar structures of society, religion, and perception since World War I. In Europe, these anxieties would find expression in the occult movement of Hitler and the Nazis and lead to the epic horror of World War II. In America, the movies were cheap and became the dominant form of cultural expression as the poor shared hardship together in a large, darkened auditorium. So 1931, America's worst year of the century, would be its best year ever for monsters. Bela Lugosi's narcissism was tailor-made to play his monster. Sixty years later, David Manners, the dashing window-dressing boyfriend in Dracula, recalled Lugosi as insufferably vain and pretentious, endlessly primping in the mirror as if he could not get enough of himself. Narcissism is an element in substance abuse, and vampire stories often contain metaphors of addiction. The two lead actors in and the director of the original Dracula all battled fierce addictions, Lugosi with heroin and Helen Chandler with alcohol, a habit she picked up, by the way, during her marriage to Cyril Hume, who would later script the early sci-fi classic Forbidden Planet. Director Todd Browning killed a fellow actor in a crash caused by his drunk driving and was blacklisted from Hollywood in 1923 and 1924 for his out of control alcohol addiction. So there has been a slow and steady softening of the vampire image since Bram Stoker and the inception of the cinematic age. This is, of course, nothing more than more sympathy for the devil. We move from the hideous, plague-infested ghoul of 1922's Nosferatu to the suave, aristocrat, stage and screen Dracula, as projected by Bela Lugosi. Lugosi took part 
in a further softening, reprising his signature role on a more lighthearted milieu with 1948's Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. This was a forerunner to for farces like Leslie Nielsen's comedic turn in Dracula, Dead and Loving It. Humorous portrayals, as in the Abbott and Costello and East Side Kid ghost comedies, which also featured Lugosi, paved the way for the sympathetic vampire Barnabas of the enormously popular 60s soap opera Dark Shadows. With Anne Rice, an interview with the vampire, the villain became protagonist, even becoming somewhat ethical. And finally, with Twilight, the vampire becomes a full-fledged romantic hero. With this, we have surreptitiously slid, slid so far down the moral scale that we find it all hearts and valentines that what is really a very old man in a young, although dead body, impregnates a high school girl who begs to stay in her flesh, exiled from God's kingdom. <coughs> Pardon me. Twilight <clears throat> is poorly written, perfumed garbage, yet it made millions catering to the fantasies of inexperienced young girls apparently unfortunate enough to live in society without benefit of arranged marriages and so succumb to nauseatingly improbable romantic delusions. There is a vampiric parallel to the two jabs people took in response to our worldwide disease. Dracula injected a venom through his two fangs into victims, turning them into the undead. Bella Lugosi deteriorated due to self-injection with heroin. The two injections that most Americans have taken since 2021 are thought by some to have initiated a new hybrid age. The bite that turns us into one of them. Not quite human, not even living. Indeed, some propose that this is the intended symbolism of the vampire myth concocted by the fallen and unclean spirits who mapped out our present scenario centuries ago. As Unplugum says, these guys are playing multi-level chess while the rest of us are playing checkers. Unbelievably, two injections were taken by 70% of the U.S. population. It was genetic alteration, not inoculation in the traditional or usual sense. And they even changed the definition of inoculation to include this virtually untested gene therapy tried out on a handful of mice. Now, adverse effects, popularly known as AEs and fatalities, are claimed by some to be mounting, although said to be publicly disguised and kept on the QT. It's easier to understand the elderly and those with comorbidities like cancer or obesity taking the jabs. Some people had their jobs or their family relations threatened. Some virtue postured, repeating the words of others, and they didn't really understand what they were talking about and felt they were protecting the people around them. As we all now know, the facts later proved much of this to be false and the perpetrators admitted to it, just as they admitted to the falsehood that you could not even get the disease if you took the poke. For no reason, people were forbidden from being with their loved ones when they were ill or passing away or gathering together to mourn at their funerals. Those fired from their jobs or booted out of the armed services they loyally served do not get their positions back just because the powers that be admitted they were wrong. They were certainly self-righteous enough to ruin the lives of many people and end free speech in America as we know it. The 501c3 church played right along with this travesty, 
Too many people in the body of Christ believe in the government and didn't even ask the Holy Spirit for guidance. They never considered any position except that put forth by the enemy led Matthew 4 world of government. They shook hands with the devil without question and should not be surprised to pull back a bloody stump. Afraid of losing their nonprofit status, they jumped when the government said jump. The absurdity didn't occur to many of being able to buy a beer but not go to church on Sunday. You could gather where the government said you could gather and the church responded like trained monkeys. It was humiliating to behold. So have most of us been scared, conned, or deceived into receiving the vampire's kiss? Or at least a test run, the first on endless steps to biosecurity in the surveillance state? Doubtless many of us will continue on with this morbid dance in Dracula's embrace choosing the cold immortality of the undead rather than the glorious kingdom of the Most High God. Frankenstein seeks resurrection without Christ. Dracula, a communion without the blood of Messiah. The werewolf, whom we shall perhaps discuss another time, merely succumbs to the beast. This is Gumbo Craig. And this is Walking Out of Babylon. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share if you are so moved. God is great all the time. Shalom.